Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Gabby Schultz. I'm a sophomore studying social studies at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag Duncan Forum, which is also listed in your program. Here to introduce our event is Director of the Institute of Politics, Mark D. Guerin. Prior to joining the IOP, Mark served as White House Communications Director and Deputy Chief of Staff, Director of the Peace Corps, and President of the Hobart and William Smith Colleges for 18 years. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests and Mark Guerin. And uh, welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. I'm Mark Guerin, Director of the Institute of Politics, and we're thrilled to have so many students and members of the Harvard community here uh, for our first forum here. And uh, no better guest than a Harvard alumnus, someone who came through these halls, went on to his own distinguished career in public service as the longest serving superintendent of the Chicago Public Schools and one of the longest uh, secretaries of education, Arne Duncan, when he was here. He was co-captain of the basketball team. And uh, I see members of the Harvard basketball team here. <laughs> Went on to uh, graduate with, with high distinction, Summa. But I see Coach Amaker here in a special way. Coach, please stand up and acknowledge the Ivy League champ here, uh, the basketball team. There's no better person to be in conversation with Secretary Duncan than uh, David Gergen, of course, a professor of practice here and the director of the Center for Public Leadership, whose public service on his own has served four presidents. So they will be in conversation about Washington, and uh, I suspect we have a lot to talk about tonight, given events. I would remind you, the Institute of Politics is very engaged in the Harvard Votes Challenge, registering uh, all Harvard students for the election. And there's a table right back there, the Harvard Votes Challenge. So we invite you to, to take advantage of the opportunity to register to vote. Tomorrow night, the forum will welcome Professor Jill Lepore from the History Department, who is coming out with a important new book on American history. And that will frame many of the conversations that we'll be having here in the forum on, uh, on the midterm elections. So we warmly welcome you tonight, and I'll turn it over to David, for, for a great conversation. Secretary Duncan, welcome. Thank welcome you. back. And thank you for, for coming back to Harvard. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and welcome one and all to the first uh, forum of the season. And you will find that this is the most prestigious uh, uh, platform in the university. We have wonderful guests coming. And with our new IOP director, Mark Guerin, we're in terrific hands as we go forward. You'll see above me and perhaps in a couple of other places, the basketball photo. Uh, there was actually a time when Duke would come to Harvard to play. Uh, and you'll see the fellow, uh, one fellow in there is uh, the captain of the Harvard team. Uh, and the other fellow is now the coach of the Harvard team. Um, Tommy one, I guess one of us won none, and one of us won three times. That was, that <laughs> was the one right there. <laughs> you, if you got by with one game, you only lost by three points. Uh, you don't get points for that. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we get, uh, Coach Hamaker, who's a wonderful human being, knows a lot about leadership, uh, has been an inspiration for this university. He's a, I think he's the best college recruiter in the country. He's brought wonderful young uh, men to play on the basketball team to Cambridge. And uh, each year over the last three years, he's brought a guest to the campus to speak. And he brought uh, Secretary Duncan Arney to the campus. Uh, but he also brought today the members of the team. So the members of the team are here. Will you stand, please? A member of the Harvard basketball team. <laughs> Thank you. 
You sure recruit short people, don't you, Tommy? Huh? <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I, I would remind on, on Arnie, Arnie, you had a distinguished record here at Harvard. Uh, among other things, he dropped out of school for one year to go work on school reform back with his mom in inner city uh, Chicago. Um, but he, he had a thousand points over a season. Uh, his b the season before he was captain when he was a junior, Harvard, I think, won six and lost 20? I don't remember. <laughs> and, well, you're an amazing coach, and next year they won nine. <laughs> so I like to kid him about that. Um, but uh, it is, uh, Arnie has had a, a distinguished career and a very passionately committed career. After, after he gave up basketball, he went to Australia for four years and played pro ball there before coming back uh, and, and decided to throw his, his, his life into uh, helping kids in K-12 situations. Uh, became, uh, became the superintendent essentially to run the, succeeded Paul Vallis, some of you may know that name, uh, to, to run the Chicago uh, school system with Mayor Daley. I uh, had a lot of support, but he reformed a great number of things. Tough go, but it really was a, uh, the place where he learned about, and by going from school to school, walking the streets, talking to kids, he really learned what, the, what was going on in neighborhoods and how we have to be more responsive in thinking this can come out of, all of, out of some theoretical book about how you teach and how, you, how kids learn. Um, and then President uh, Obama in his early days, who had been a, uh, uh, a basketball player, co-partner on basketball, uh, asked Arnie to come in and be Secretary of Education and he was one of the longest serving secretaries in our history, so we're we're honored to have you here, and it's good to see you again. Mm -hmm. um, and he's his days as secretary were some of the most, I think, some of the most impactful. We'll talk more about that. Um, but first of all, Arnie, we've been the the nation ha in Washington and beyond, in state capitals and in cities, has been now arguing and talking about school reform for some 40 years. I remember all the way going back to early 80s where that National Commission came out about uh, the state of American schools and said there's, quote, a rising tide of mediocrity mm -hmm. in our schools and warned us that there were not only inequities within the United States among our students, our own students, but increasingly other countries were becoming uh, more educated and were passing us by on various uh, uh, measures. Uh, and that's when Arnie got very deeply engaged himself uh, and we've been at it for 40 years. And I remember back in those early years, too, that when you sat down with governors, say you, you could sit down with a Tommy Thompson, the governor of Wisconsin, a Republican, and Bill Clinton, Democrat, Arkansas, or Jim Hunt, Democrat, North Carolina, and you talked about education reform. It was almost as if you couldn't tell which one was the Democrat and which one was the Republican, because what they really cared about were kids and how do you best serve kids. And they were very pra pragmatic about that. It was not ideological. And now we've come to a time when, you know, the New York Times over the weekend has had its Sunday edition, teachers just want to teach, but the classroom has become a battleground. Classroom has become a battleground. So first of all, after all these years of reform, bring us up to speed about, give us a snapshot of where we stand on K-12 education in this country today. We've made a lot of progress in one area, and that, that is graduation rates, but how much real progress have we made yeah. in other areas? I'll actually just quickly say I'm thrilled to be here and I told David to ask about anything personally professionally I want you guys to do the same thing I'd rather just be interesting than boring um, I just want the audience to know how much respect I have for, for David and he was one of two people him and Colin Powell that I would sort of quietly call when I was struggling on stuff to get advice and to and he always told me exactly what I needed to hear not what I wanted to hear but what he thought I, so I just want you to know how much I, I personally appreciate, appreciate that, that some of his lengthy experience. Washington was like another world to me and lots of, uh, lots of mistakes, lots of things to learn, but just to have someone who I trusted totally to give me his best thinking, um, that, that meant so much. So the, the, the short answer is whether you take early childhood education, which I think is the best investment you can make, <coughs> K to 12, math scores, reading scores, science scores, graduation rates, higher ed completion, uh, the United States is top 10 in nothing. So early childhood, we're 28th to 30th. 
which is a, we should be absolutely ashamed that we allow so many babies to start kindergarten each year, a year, 18 months behind. And the dirty secret is in education is we often don't help them catch up. So those, you can draw a straight line from the kids that start kindergarten too far behind to your future high school dropouts. Uh, math reading scores usually somewhere between 50th and, and uh, 20th, 25th. Higher education a generation ago, we led the world in college completion. Um, we have flatlined, we have stagnated, and we're now about 16th. So in a globally competitive economy, in a flat world where we, I think, should want to have the best educated workforce in the world to try and keep high-wage, high-skilled jobs in this country, <coughs> um, we are not getting better fast enough. Um, I think we're very complacent. We're still living in an era where mentally we're living in an era that is gone, where we dominated the world educationally. And to not be top 10 or even close to top 10 in anything, um, we should be ashamed. Why are we here? Um, we can blame politicians, and I'll blame lots of politicians, left and right, and that for me, education should al always be the ultimate bipartisan issue. But I am convinced we are in this position because none of us vote on education. And it's not the politicians' fault, it's our fault as voters. Mm -hmm. um, we don't hold anyone accountable for increasing access to pre-K and raising graduation rates and reducing dropout rates and making college more accessible and affordable. And if mayors were held accountable, if governors were held accountable, congressmen, senators, presidents, for what am I doing to contribute uh, to this? I, I worked for Mayor Daley. Mayor Daley had strengths and weaknesses like lots of folks, but he led the Chicago public school system. And if I didn't do a good job, if things weren't getting better, if he didn't do a good job, he was going to lose his job. He was accountable for that. And until we, in educate, until we as voters, not just parents, but as citizens, vote on education, every politician loves sound bites, they love photo ops, they love to yeah. pat kids on the head and go to school. You'll never hear politicians say they're anti-education, but we allow the platitudes. We don't demand substance, we don't demand accountability. You, last thing, you watch presidential debates, it just breaks my heart. No one ever talks about education. You never hear education talked about in presidential debates. Why? Because we don't vote on it. So until we vote across the political spectrum, left, right, I could care less, until we vote on education, we're going to continue to be mediocre at huge costs to social mobility, to our economy. And I worry about our democracy fraying right now. Mm -hmm. And fraying allowing, you know, yes, race and class, that's real, but fraying based upon haves and have nots and education opportunities. Right. So uh, you would say that when mayors take over schools, that the, the positive upside of that is at least there's someone who's accountable. The mayor and becomes accountable. Yes, and there's you downside, and that's wildly controversial, and not everyone agrees with me, but when you have school boards that 9, 10, 12 people, no one quite knows who they are, 3, 4, 5% of people vote in school board elections, everybody has their own constituency, often it's by geography, or you got the, the white board member, the black board member, the Latino board member, the gifted parents, you know, board member, the special needs kids' parents, and everyone looks out for their small slice of the pie, mm -hmm. and they don't look at the bigger picture. And I would love to see every politician, not just mayors, but starting with mayors. And David, you know this, most mayors run away from education right. because it's the hardest issue. Very few mayors run to towards education. And whether it's Mayor Daley or Mayor Bloomberg, whoever, where you have a small handful of mayors who actually want to take on this challenge, um, I think we need to embrace that. And again, if they do a good job, then they earn the privilege of keeping that job. And if they don't do a good job, they should lose that job. Right. Um, are you at all concerned that the spirit of reform, which has been so strong in, in recent years, we started out in a very bipartisan way, then, but then people were still very concerned about, and we've gotten polarized over education reform. But now we don't even talk about it very much. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the current secretary focuses on higher education, but we don't hear a lot about how are we really going to fix these systemic problems in K-12. I think that absence or that void in leadership, that voice is devastating. And what I would say, Dave, again, I'll always go early childhood, K-12, to higher ed, take them all because right. we have to focus on the whole, continuing the whole pipeline. So I would argue that our goal should be to lead the world in access to pre-K, that that's the best investment we can make. We were very proud to get high school graduation rates to 84%, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, the current administration, the goal should be to get that to 90%. And to be clear, 84%, that was better, but that still means, mm -hmm. David, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kids dropping out every single year with no chance to make it in today's you know, economy. 
I think we should try and lead the world in college completion. What you don't hear ever from this administration and from others, you don't hear any talk of those goals. And for me, there's nothing partisan or political about any of those goals. Those are nation-building goals. Um, you have a total absence of vision. You have an absence of goals. Now, if we could agree on those goals, David, I think we should have lots of vigorous debate about the best strategies to achieve those goals. And right. there should be, again, no one has a monopoly of good ideas, and what works in Montana might be different than, you know, Boston, might be different than inner city Chicago. We should innovate, we should scale, we should look at what's worked, we should have all kinds of, you know, debate there. But if we as a nation could agree on some big picture goals and hold ourselves collectively yeah. accountable, whoever was in power, Republican, Democrats, over time, we don't have any of that. I would argue, this is my personal opinion, obviously, I would argue this administration does not want a well-educated citizenry, does not want people who can think independently. So the absence of voice is not a mistake. I would argue that's intentional, that's by design. That's a pretty stunning charge. You might not agree? Um, no, I, 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 no, but I, I, I was just, I, I was just I, considering. I, I, there was a time, I, you'll remember, and women in this room will remember so much more vividly than I will, that we had been people that said we should not educate women. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's the best way to keep them in the kitchen or whatever, right. to right. keep them marginalized. Right, so uh, I'm always honest. And again, that was happy true about blacks. Yep. That people didn't want to educate blacks. Happy to, happy to debate and happy to have con contrary opinions. And again, this is not about parties. It's about the current president. Um, when you have authoritarian tendencies, when you say the press is the enemy of the people, when you say what you're watching and seeing isn't real, let me tell you the truth, yeah. you don't want people who can think critically. You don't want people who can think for themselves. And um, it's for me, again, way beyond education and education policy. It scares me for our country and it scares me for our democracy. How can, we, there's no question that education, po school reform has become politicized. And you found that when you were secretary. I mean, you got hit from the right uh, on, you know, race to the top. You got hit on your whole, especially common core. They called it Obama Corps, as you, as you note in your book. Anything that had Obama's name on it was opposed on education reform. And at the same time, the left came after you teachers, especially the teachers' unions, saying, wait a minute, we don't want these, te we want to be tested, we don't want all these assessments, we don't want to be judged, and we don't want to have our pay depend on your assessment tools, mm -hmm. which you felt were pretty essential. How do we get beyond this? How, it's, it's like a question of, across many fields. How do we get beyond the polit politicization of climate change? How do we get beyond this in education? Yeah, well, again, I think we need to decide are these things ultimately important? Let me just take a minute and sort of unpack some of that and sort of talk about, again, we, we did some things well, we made plenty of mistakes, we can talk about what we did <coughs> and what worked or too much or too slow or too fast. But right now, David, we, we, we had, when we walked in, you had 50 states with 50 different standards. And in many states, those standards were so low, and I came from one of those states, so this is personal in Illinois, where if you were meeting the state standards, if the state of Illinois was telling, telling young kids that they were proficient, and I talk about this in the book, the University of Chicago did some research on this, if you were hitting the Illinois state benchmarks, you were on track to get a 16 on the ACT. A 16 gives you less than a 10% chance of graduating so from, uh, from the college. The, the, the highest score in the, is 36? 36. And you need to get 20, 20 sort of puts you in the ballpark. Right. Not for Harvard, but to do, you know, not everyone has to go to Harvard, just to be successful in college. So when you had many, many states with standards that were lying to kids, and for me it's the most insidious thing is to tell young people and their families they are on track to be successful when they're not, um, we were arguing for high standards. And all we were arguing for was our definition of high <coughs> standards. States had to say that if you met these standards that you didn't have to take remedial classes in college. Because we all talk about the cost of college. We, we don't talk about is we spend about $9 billion each year, $9 billion for high school graduates to go to college, to pay college tuition, to take high school classes again, not getting, not getting college credit, burn through Pell Grants, burn through scholarships, burn through whatever. And so all we wanted was in Texas, at the University of Texas, to say that if you hit these standards, that you can, you can, you can uh, go to our, our University of Texas and not take high school classes again. Um, 
I don't know of any employers today who say we are going to locate our plant, our facility, our campus in Iowa because of Iowa standards are different than Minnesota standards or Wisconsin standards. So the idea that we need 50 different goalposts right. doesn't make sense to me. Um, the fact that we have 50 different goalposts and many are low is really insidious. So that was part of the challenge was for high standards. Mm -hmm. There was some, the left sort of accepted that more, the right there was more pushback. Again, you're trying to you know, federalize or take away local control. Um, for me, where you need local control, local innovation is how do you hit high standards, but we should agree on what those high standards look like. Um, I would say one of the mistakes we made, we called it the common core. We should have called it the very, very uncommon and unique core for every <laughs> single state. And I, I say that sort of funny, but sort of not funny. And what you saw is many states rebrand Buckeye standards, Illini standards, Hoosier standards, whatever. Call it whatever you want. The truth is most states kept those high standards. And so that, mm -hmm. that I thought was a win. So that was the pushback on the right. The pushback on the left, as you said totally accurately, is that we also <laughs> thought and believed that great teachers matter. That having great teachers, particularly in underserved commu communities, changes kids' lives. Um, Roz Chetty, an economist here, did this remarkable longitudinal study over a couple of decades and found one good teacher, one good teacher raised the lifetime earnings of that classroom by $250,000. Yeah, that's Think right. about that. That's yeah. not about test scores. It's not even about graduation rates. It's about changing the trajectory of life. Yeah. The, the, the Chetty research was very interesting because what you said it was, if you, take, if you have one good teacher, the impact, the, the, the conscious impact on a, on a student fades away. Yeah. It doesn't last. But the unconscious part of it, what actually happens in their lives changes quite a lot. W Wendy Kopp is, uh, of Teach for America, mm -hmm. as you know so well, um, has made the argument, and I, th I thought she was studying research, that if you have two or three in a row, two, two or three good teachers in a row, that can really change your life. That can change your life, and the converse, David, is if you have two or three bad ones in a row, yeah. you can be so far behind yeah. that you can't catch up. Yep. And so what we try to say is that great teaching matters. Now, there's lots of, there should be lots of vigorous debate as what defines a great teacher. And mm -hmm. it should never just be a test score. It should never right. be, you know, it always multiple measures, multiple measures. Peer evaluation is huge. Principal evaluation. Survey students. We all know those teachers in our lives that made a difference. But to not talk about teacher quality, uh, one of the things that stunned me going to D.C., again, you, different world, is I found there were, there were like uh, about 10 states that it was, a, just listen carefully to this, 10 states where it was against the law. It was literally against the law to link student learning and teacher evaluation. So that was actually, for all the controversies race at top, that was actually the only criteria, that was the only mandate, as you said, you could not apply for race at top if it was against the law to link student learning. Yeah. And all those laws went away in a hurry. And I just think, again, great teachers matter. This is a profession. Many of us are in this room because we are so lucky to have great teachers in our life. And we got to at least have the courage to have that conversation. So you, in your book, you and, and I'm going to say more about this book, but you should know that he just published How Schools Work by Arnie Duncan. If you want to learn more, I'll bring it up again with another endorsement. <laughs> the, um, uh, but you make a point. You, you, you really almost trash uh, the public, the, the schools, the universities that offer teacher training and certificates uh, because you're, they're not preparing people for a profession. They, they, somebody graduates from college, they get thrown into yeah. a classroom with no, basically no other instruction, very different from the law and very different from medicine, yeah. when there's a lot of preparation before you take full responsibility. Yeah. How do we, you know, sh sh should, should we burn down the schools of education and start over? Um, not all of them, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say this. Um, people talk about the results in Finland. Finland yeah. has eight schools of education, mm -hmm. and basically only the top third or the tw top fourth of students have the privilege, have the right to apply to those training programs. And extraordinarily, vi extraordinarily vigorous. Um, we have 1,400 schools of education. There are no standards of what that looks like. I just try and listen to teachers. So this is not anecdotes. There's also hundreds and hundreds of anecdotes. But if you survey young teachers, basically two thirds say they're not prepared to enter the classroom. Right. And what I always say, if two-thirds of doctors said they were unprepared to practice medicine, we would have a revolution in this country. But we don't value teachers. We don't value education. We allow that to happen. 
So not all, but in many colleges, the schools of education are cash cows. They are revenue producers. Um, they bring in sometimes lower caliber students. They graduate them with honors at two and three times the rest of the university. Mm -hmm. And two thirds of those graduates who are the hardest working, the most committed, the most altruistic people who wanna go back to their communities and make a difference, they are unprepared to do this tough, challenging, difficult, complex, but extraordinarily important work. That's not fair to those teachers. That's not fair to those students. The New York Times has research on the front page today that says that students do better if the teachers they have in the classroom look like them, that, they're, that they can identify themselves or, or align themselves by who the, the identity of the person who's teaching. And I think it's true, I think, it's true, I think your book says that in Chicago, about a third of the people of K-12 age are white, about a third are black, about a third are Latino but the percentage of kids in schools who are white is about six or eight percent. It's quite small. It, the, sc the schools are quite segregated. So you've got 90 percent of your kids in some of these inner schools, inner city schools are minorities. And yet if you look at the, the demographics of teachers, 80 percent of the teachers in this country are white. And 77 percent are women. So um, by definition, you don't have the best outcomes. How do we move beyond this? I thought we were moving toward a day when we would have far more better representation of minorities, especially in the teaching positions. So I, not an easy question to answer. I would challenge schools of education, but not them alone, that when less than 2% of our nation's teachers are black men, Mm -hmm. when less than 2% are Latino men, and you think about the number of our young boys of color who are growing up in homes that aren't blessed to have a, often a father, the need for those strong, positive male role models is, is desperate. And the fact that, again, we have no sense of urgency. We don't recruit, we don't attract, we don't retain, we don't build pipelines. Um, there are outside of normal structures, outside of universities, outside of schools of education, there are groups of educators of color who are taking it upon themselves to attract and retain and recruit and nurture. There's a guy who worked for me in DC who's an amazing principal in, in Philly who's building a network of black male educators and building that pipeline. But the question you're asking is a really pointed one, David, is how come schools of education, how come universities don't take this on? Um, TFA that you've been a huge supporter of and I'm a big fan of. It's Teach for America. Teach for America. All kinds of legitimate questions and concerns and complaints. Um, but a huge proportion of those incoming core members each year are people of color, our first generation who are committed to the communities where they came from. Wildly higher percentages there than traditional schools of education. That's hard to argue with that commitment. Yeah. It, uh, Teach for America has worked very hard to, to get the number of, uh, of people of color up. Uh, it's, been a hard, it's been a hard go. Uh, and there is some evidence that the more uh, folks you get who are coming in from people of color, uh, they come from, they come from the second standards, what one might call the second tier schools or even third tier schools. And they're not necessarily the people who are doing well in those schools. Mm -hmm. So it's it's there's a and uh, there's a real issue there in, in the recruitment for charter schools, for example. Are you do you remain a big f supporter of charter schools? I'm a big supporter of good schools, and I could care less whether they're charter or traditional or mm -hmm. magna sure. IB. There's nothing about the name charter that tells me anything about quality. Yeah. So yeah. show me your results. Show me yeah. what your graduation rate is. Show me what percent of, what percent of your kids are going on to college. So I went to you know, National Charter School Convention. And I, to be clear, I visited hundreds and hundreds of amazing charter schools that are changing lives every single day and help start many in Chicago. But there's a set of charter schools that are dropout factories. And I challenge the charter community to close those schools down and yeah. not hide behind the name. So we just, I, I was, you know, no seven-year-old, they don't know if they go to a charter school or traditional whatever. Am I safe? Do I have a great principal? Do I have great teachers? Where we have schools like that, we need to replicate them and learn from them and do more. We have schools that don't fit that profile. We need to do something else and challenge that's, that status that's, quo. 
very fair answer. So, but bottom line, you, you argue that we ought to have a grand bargain with teachers, and in effect, that uh, they get the resources they need, which and and they're treated as professionals as they should be, yeah. paid as professionals, and in return for that, there's accountability. Yeah, the, the two grand bargains that for me, it, easy to articulate, it's obviously been harder to get there. That. I would argue teachers are desperately underpaid in our country. I would love to double teacher salaries tomorrow. I would love to pay teachers more to work in inner city Roxbury or to work in Appalachia or to work on Native American reservations. Principals are CEOs. There's, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of schools all over the country. I've never been to a great school that doesn't have a great principal. Business, government, nonprofit, sports, you don't see successful enterprises about great leadership. So I would pay Everyone more, I'd pay them more for difficult assignments, I'd pay them more for success, but the trade-off is that we have to be accountable for results and we have to be learning and we have to be getting better. Um, and we don't do either. We don't hold people accountable and we don't pay them. So we're like in the worst possible uh, quadrant if you look at that. Uh, the other thing um, I, I think about is it's hard to go back to taxpayers for another nickel, obviously now this is a tough time, but could you go out and say, we'll only take resources over time if we're hitting these benchmarks. So almost like a qualifier there that, that you, would have to, you would have to hit to get those resources. The final thing is we have in, in every, for me it's not about battling unions and not unions. I actually think we need strong unions. I think that's, that's important, particularly probably now more than ever. But we always have one teacher's contract. What if there were two teacher's contracts that the union could negotiate? One would be sort of the traditional I would argue low risk, low reward, lane and step every year and you gotta wait 30 years to make more, more money. Or what if, if you were a hot shot teacher making amazing results, what if you could make $100,000 when you were 29 or 30? And sort of a higher risk, much higher reward contract, both of which would be negotiated. So those are deals that we could work out union and management with the public if we just had a little bit more courage and unfortunately, and we lack that political More courage. willingness to compromise. And to not be satisfied. Again, for me, it's, we're, just far, we're just so complacent. There's not yeah. the sense of urgency. And I see the devastating consequences of when we don't educate every single day. Yeah. Arnie, it's, been, it's striking that, that in the last, in recent months that you, and I think over the last few years, you have thrown yourself now into the issue of violence in schools and guns in schools. Where are we on that and where are we headed? And we're gonna go to the floor here very shortly, but I really wanted to get this guns issue on the table. Yeah, I'll, I'll take two minutes and then, sure, then open please. it up. So this one is very, very personal. Um, I grew up as a part of my mother's after school program. When I got to be 12, 13, started leaving there and wanted to play basketball. So if you want to play basketball, you played in the south and west sides of Chicago because that's where the players were. And there were a set of guys who were older who mentored me and honestly protected me and kept me safe and helped get me in and out of neighborhoods. And when I was a teen, I started to lose some of those guys to gun violence. Mm. And when you're a kid, I think that shapes you and I would say maybe scars you in some ways a little bit hard to talk about. I'm 53 now, that's 40 years ago. That's a long, that's a long time. Um, when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, all the traditional stuff we worry about, academic achievement, graduation rates, budgets, union management, facilities. I don't wanna say that was easy, David, but that was, easier compared to dealing with gun violence. And I hate saying this, but it's during my watch, during my seven and a half years leading the Chicago Public Schools, on average, we had a child, a student, one of my students killed every two weeks. Um, not one in school. Schools were generally the safest place in community. But going to those funerals, getting to know those families after their baby was dead, uh, going to classrooms, there's an empty, chair and trying to talk to kids and make sense of the census, that was by far the hardest part of my job. Nothing else came close and that got harder over time. Uh, in hindsight, very, very naively, when my family and I, when, when we moved to DC, I thought it couldn't get worse in Chicago. I thought we were at rock bottom. <laughs> and for a whole host of reasons, during the seven years we, we were in DC, things got a lot worse in Chicago. So we had, um, almost 700 homicides last year. We had almost 5,000 people shot. And the level of fear and trauma that our kids were living with every single day is stunning. Um, I kept a, a, a picture above my desk in Chicago when a middle school student gave to me. It was a picture of him climbing up a ladder outside a building. 
and, it's, and he wrote his caption. His, his caption was, if I grow up, I want to be a fireman. And that for me was just so, you know, when I was growing up, it was always when I grow up, when I grow up. But for so many of our kids, they literally don't think they're going to live past 18, 19, particularly our young boys and young, young men of color. So for me, leaving the administration, going home, David, this was the crisis facing the city. Mm -hmm. The city gave me everything, <laughs> athletically, academically, socially, culturally, amazing mentors. And for me to go home and not try and help make the city a safer place for everybody, but particularly for kids, would have felt, just wouldn't have felt right. So um, it's a little bit of a turn. I wouldn't say it's a, a radical turn, but we're, we are uh, working directly with a young man most likely to shoot and be shot, which in Chicago are young men 17 to 24 who are African American. Um, we are hiring them. We're moving them out of the street economy. We provide life coaches and wraparound services and trauma care. I've had a whole host of guys get high school diplomas. They work with us for about a year and we move them on into the legal economy after that. And these are amazing. It's the most hardest work I've ever done, most humbling work I've ever done. How's it Heartbreaking. Going? Um, I am very, very hopeful long term. Um, Chicago is, not to go on too long on it, the, the whole thing with the police is broken. Um, in Chicago last year, if you kill, there's something called the clear rate, which I'm obsessed with, which is the percent of crimes that get solved. In Chicago, if you kill someone, there's a 17% chance that you'll be caught. So 83% of homicides go unsolved. If you shoot someone but don't kill them, that's about a 3 or 4%. So we can say that black lives matter. We can say those things. But in Chicago, that's not the reality. And if those victims looked more like you and I, I promise you there'd be some very different things going on. So I can't get rid of the guns. I can't structurally now although we're starting to work at it, rebuild trust between the police and the community, which is totally broken. What I can do is give guys a reason to put down the guns. And in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And the opportunity here is it is so violent. It is, we have one guy who's been shot 13 times, another guy's been shot 22 times. I could tell you a million stories that would just blow your minds. They're tired of getting shot. They're tired of being chased. They're not getting rich on the streets, and they want to path out. And people often say, oh, it's so, so great you're giving people a second chance. I, I really believe is for the vast majority, we're giving them a first chance. They never had a first chance. And every, everything in society, their families, our schools, the churches, the nonprofits, we were all absent. The streets were there. The streets sucked them up. And that inevitably leads to this gun violence that is just out of control. So are you saying that there's so many guns that even if you had real serious gun control, it would be out of control? No, we don't have serious gun control. It, it, so would serious so gun control fix it? Serious gun, if I could do it, if I could wave a magic wand, David, I would get rid of those guns. And people always say, well, Chicago's got great gun laws, so tough, so you know, what you're saying makes no sense. I remind people that we live a half hour from Indiana. Indiana, we're not an island. We don't have a moat around Chicago. There's a huge influx of guns from Indiana every single day. I can tell you the five gun shops that produce hugely disproportionate number of our homicides. And so we as a nation, again, what I believe, we as a nation value our guns more than we value our kids, more than we value our children. Wow. I'll go one more step on that. Okay. Um, and just in my own pessimism, but when my kids are being killed in Chicago, they were almost all black and Latino. What I believed I don't think I've ever quite said it publicly. What I believed is it would take white kids being killed for anything to change. That's what I believed. Um, let me keep going. <laughs> then we had the Sandy Hook massacre. Mm -hmm. And in my worst nightmare, I never imagined 20 babies and five teachers and a principal being killed. My worst day in D.C., President Obama, who dealt with the hardest issues on the planet, his worst day in D.C., he went down the next day. The vice president and I went down a couple days later stayed friends of many of those families. Um, subsequent to that massacre, we got zero done in terms of gun control, zero. I would argue our biggest failure. So what I actually believe is while we don't value black and brown lives enough, we don't value any of our children's lives enough. And that that event did nothing to change the nation's consciousness around the availability of handguns. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's devastating. Final thing I'll say is I've been very pessimistic. Unfortunately, post the Parkland massacre, um, those young kids are helping to lead, and we're doing 
we've partnered, they're doing lots of stuff of our kids I'm working with in Chicago and really building a coalition. I think those kids are going to help lead the country where we as adults have failed to take them. The Parkland yeah. kids. Parkland kids, and Chicago and kids, and DC yeah. kids working together. There's an energy and a movement. My family and I went to the march in Washington. We bust down 400 of the young men we're working with. It's unbelievably powerful to have them be part of the solution and see that. Um, I think it's like, a, it's like any movement, civil rights movement, you know, protests against Vietnam War. Those weren't led by people our age. Those were led by young people willing to put their, their bodies on the line, and mm -hmm. that's what these young people are doing. So I am more hopeful now than I have been for a long, long time, but we have so far to go. That's well, that's striking. I'm glad we ended on an encouraging note <laughs> before we go to the floor. Uh, but it's true. I mean, we had the, the Parkland kids came here, uh, and they were inspiring. They, everybody had to... You know, Emma and David Hogg and those, uh, they were really, they were ter terrific young people. And you, you did walk away from that with the sense that it's also we see now with this younger people running for office yeah, yeah. Uh, and the breakthroughs that are occurring. There's something that there is positive. There's a real, yeah. it's starting to be a pushback yeah. that is more than say a negative pushback. It yeah. is also, okay, what are we gonna do to fix yeah. it? I'll tell you one quick story. So after that, when they were getting going, this is like in the first week, Somehow they heard about our week and our work in Chicago and they reached out and I wanted to make sure. So obviously they dealt with this horrific tragedy, but candidly, they, they've been safe all their lives. And our kids have lived with this every single day, every single day from the time they were born. So I wanted to bridge that gap. And I said, could we, um, could we FaceTime with the kids? And Emma and her mom said, no, just have the kids come down and come down to our house. And a set of our kids went to Emma's house and spent the weekend. It was transformational on, on both sides, sort of lifelong friendships. It was interesting. Um, our kids had never seen a gated community before. They didn't know what that was. So they sort of thought Emma and her family were in jail. They couldn't sort of quite figure out what that was. But what one of our young men, Alex King, said is, again, wildly different worlds, racially, socioeconomically, geographically. But he said that our, our shared pain makes us family. And I hate that young, young kids are bonding over their shared pain. But that bond is powerful and that bond is motivating mm. and that's going to move them again across these wildly different worlds. They are moving together in a really powerful way and that's, that's, that's political movements is when people come yeah. together around a shared goal. I hate that it's to end gun violence. I wish they could do something easier, more fun, but that's, that's what we've forced them to do and they're, they're, they're not going to take it. They're, they're, not gonna, they're not accepting it and we, we, need that, we need that lack of acceptance. Terrific. Let's go to the floor. And uh, we'll, we'll talk for about 25, 30 more minutes. There are microphones. There's one here and one here. I think there's one there. And is there one there? Yes, there are four microphones. If you would, please, just so uh, to reintroduce you to the, to the forum. Uh, the one question per customer. Uh, identify yourself, please. And remember that a question ends with a question mark. <laughs> so... Uh, Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please. Hi, uh, I'm Annalisa Kingsbury. I'm a freshman at the college, and I just wanted to ask about uh, the issue of school segregation. So you mentioned some public schools in Chicago that are 98% minority students. I come from New York, which is one of the most segregated public school systems in America. So I was wondering how you think we should address this issue of segregation in public high schools. Whether you think that there should be affirmative action in public schools in America, or whether you think there should be a diversity requirement. Thank you. Yeah. Great question, hard question. It's actually one of the areas, David, where I would give myself relatively low marks when I was in D.C. I would love to have done more to reduce segregation or increase integration, and we did some things, but I, I don't think we were wildly successful. So the difficulty, obviously, is that public schools reflect the geography in which they are situated, and we as America have chosen to segregate in the vast majority of communities by race, by class, by whatever. Um, I don't think you can force integration. I don't think you should mandate busing. That Places like Boston have had very tough experiences there. Um, there are things we try, we put money behind magnet schools to try and help to foster some integration. A little bit of success, but, but not a ton. So two thoughts. One, places like Denver have done some interesting things where, so it's a little technical, but most schools have an attendance boundary, sort of a circle around it. What Denver has done is taken eight schools and done one big attendance boundary. And no money, no whatever, 
but just created a lot more access. Now, there's always downsides. Stuff is hard. What that means is if you live right next door to a school, you may not be guaranteed access, and you have to deal with angry parents. What do you mean I can't go to school half a block down, the, down from where I live? So it's not always easy. So, but finding ways to think differently about attendance areas and boundaries is uh, one way to do that. Not force busing, but putting some resources behind busing can, can, can help there. Um, at the end of the day, though, where I come down is that parents, white, black, Latina, doesn't matter, rich, poor, doesn't matter, parents want really high quality schools. And one thing we tried to do, and we did some, and I think we could keep thinking about, is we put and created really high quality schools in historically minority neighborhoods. And great for the neighborhoods, but white parents would seek out those schools. And white parents would send kids to neighborhoods where they wouldn't normally go because they had a chance to have an amazing international baccalaureate curriculum or fine performing arts curriculum. So thinking about how do we create very, very high quality schools that are schools of choice, not schools that are last resort in unlikely places, giving parents opportunity to attend, thinking differently about attendance areas. Um, ultimately, our schools are gonna reflect our society. <laughs> And the long-term thing is how do we reduce our fear of one another? And how do we start to feel more comfortable living around people and in communities on blocks with people who don't look just like us and have our backgrounds? That's a much harder thing. Um, unfortunately, I think our country is splintering. We're going in the opposite direction. And I'm hoping young people can come together as they get older and own homes to decide to do something a little bit different. Sure. Please. Hi, my name is Kara. I'm a junior in the college. I'm studying government and education, so this is particularly interesting. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, given the constraints on public administrations with time, given term, li term limits and uh, electoral concerns, um, but the ability to experiment on large scale or with huge scope um, versus nonprofits, which have um, sort of long-term viability, uh, but without the sort of ability to scale. What, how would you say, um, what would you say the roles are for nonprofits and the public sector in education reform? So what is the appropriate role? I'll, I'll take the government side first. And the federal is always a huge debate. What's the federal role? And it sort of applies state, state and local. For me, there's sort of three fundamentals. One is you have to fight for equity. So you have to fight for the least, the least privileged, the least advantaged whether it's English language learners, whether it's first generation you know, goers, whether it's kids with special needs, pre-K I would put on that list, that you have to fight for equity. Um, secondly, you have to fight for excellence. So for me, it's not just a low bar. For me, that's the high standards. That's saying that good teachers matter. It's having an expectation that every high school graduate would graduate not just with a high school diploma, but with a college credit in their back pocket or industry certification, so college and careers. The third thing I would say, and this is where we break down education, it kills me, for every challenge we have, inner city, rural, remote, it is being solved impeccably somewhere. And I tell some of the many stories in the book of just extraordinary schools beating all the odds for very interesting reasons. What we don't do in, interest, in education enough is scale what works. And again, not, take out politics, take out, just show me your results. Show me what you're doing to increase graduation rates. Show me what you're doing and let's help you do a lot more of that. So for me, those are the roles that government, local, state, but particularly national, equity, excellence, and innovation that we should always be focused on and, and doing more, more with. Um, nonprofits, that's, you know, my mother ran a small nonprofit for 52 years until her health gave out. That's sort of, I'm running a small nonprofit now. It's sort of where, where my heart is. I think the, it's never either or, it's both and, where those groups can partner I always say that programs don't change kids' lives, it's relationships. It's not the name of the nonprofit, it's the relationship with a young person that's going to, a mentor, or like whatever you, a tutor that's gonna change things. Our kids, I was just, our young men that we're working with now, it wasn't that they grew up in single parent homes, they often grew up basically in no parent homes. Mom was an alcoholic on crack, dad was locked up or gone and all of us were absent. <laughs> and so they get raised by the streets, by the gang. That's who feeds them, that's who gives them clothes. The youngest story I've heard from one of our guys is that he started selling drugs at nine years old. Mm. He said, Arnie, that was really hard to sell drugs at nine. I'm like, I bet it was. 
but he didn't have a choice. That was his reality. So it's a long answer. We as nonprofits, we as churches, we as social service agencies, it's not every young man or every young woman. Who are those that don't have any stability at home? <laughs> and what are we doing to make a 15-year commitment to that person for the long haul to give them a path out? That's where I think the, the, the magic or the genius of nonprofits needs to be. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for your time. Okay, yeah. My name is Soraya Ramos. I am a first generation student. I am a, f a former teacher at Chicago Public Schools and a, form a recent alum of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. You touched on teacher diversity and student activism. And whereas representation does matter in our teachers, it's also on the curriculum and what we're offering. So do you see your narrative and what we're teaching you? Are we yeah. talking about the community inequities? Yeah. So what do you think the role of schools is in promoting the social political awareness yeah. and also in uh, creating student activists? Yeah, so I got too many stories now, but I live in a world of stories. So I'll try and be very, very quick and try and answer it directly. Um, we're working with a group of young men who were creating a lot of violence, who were in a couple decade war with lots of bodies on both sides. And this group watched us for about a year, decided we were for real and said, we'll put down the guns if, we'll come, if you'll hire us. We talked a while, had some pretty intense conversations, did that in January. There hasn't been a single shooting with that group in eight months, stunning. Um, we took that group of young men, subset of them, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, down to see, uh, uh, Brian Stevenson's museum. Yeah. I, uh, what's, what's the right name of it? Birmingham. E e uh, Birmingham, isn't it? It's in Birmingham. I forget. I call it the lynching museum. That's not the technical yeah. term. That's what I call it. Our young men, it blew them away. And what they came back, all kinds of emotions, said, we don't know our history. We don't, no one's ever taught us our history. And how do we start to understand where we came from in historical struggles? And it, 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 like, it blew their mind. So how we, different cultures, how do we help people understand their histories? How do we help them understand their people's struggles? There are massive gaps that lead to some pretty horrific outcomes. Um, can you train, train student activists? That's interesting. I think we can absolutely train student leaders, and maybe that's the same thing or, you know, or not. Um, Talk about school reform, you ask any high school student what's working in their high school or not, they will tell you. The question is, are we, are we willing to listen? Are we willing to listen? Are we willing to act on it? And again, young people in Parkland are, are pretty interesting, they're, but they're not unique. They're brilliant kids, all, you know, every high school around the country. I think we as adults are scared to hear those truths, and so we sort of push that to the side. So thinking about understanding historically the, the battles and the struggles, um, thinking through how we help give students real voice in shaping everything, not just curriculum, but the structure of the school day, mm -hmm. the structure of the school week, having them give us some input, what teachers are making a difference, what teachers aren't. Um, you know, adults will often lie to you. Kids don't lie to you too often. Kids tell you pretty straight what they're thinking. And I think it's a massively under, you know, free, underutilized resource. Mm -hmm. Please. Son, hi. My name is Joan Moon. I'm a second year MPP here at HKS. I was a 2010 TFA core member. I taught in the Bronx for seven years. And right in the middle of the seven years was the rollout of Race to the Top. Um, so my question is about the backlash that you experienced with the Common Core. Um, right around the time of Race to the Top, I had a lot of friends who were parents asking me, why is my kid learning math in this way? And there was a lot of misunderstanding. And I would go on about, well, it's about number sense and this yeah. and that. But um, it, there seemed to be, I don't know, like maybe no marketing strategy to parents about what we're trying to do with Common yeah. Core. Yeah. And so my question is, was there a marketing strategy? And if for whatever reason, now that you would look back at that time in hindsight, is there anything that you would change about the political strategy in rolling that out? Yeah. Um, I'll try and be brief. A lot, a lot that we like to think through. So let me sort of unpack. People say Common Core, and people have very different conceptions of what that means. Let me just talk about three different parts of it. First, there's standards, higher standards, which we sort of talked about a little bit earlier at the top. And I think there was some, you know, 
Obamacare, Obamacore push back against higher standards. I think intellectually I can make a pretty compelling case that high standards are important and conversely that low standards are pretty insidious, particularly for the most disadvantaged kids. So my kids are gonna be okay whatever the standards are because my wife and I are gonna make sure they're okay. Other kids aren't so fortunate and I open the book with a story about a young man who because of low standards had no idea how far behind he was in edu educationally and his story is a decent part of the reason why I've done in my life what I've done. So that's standards. Secondly, that's what you need to know. The next question is, how do you measure whether you know that or not? That's assessments. Right? You know, that's tests. And we had, again, had 50 states, 50 different tests, 50 different goalposts. Hard to really know who's, you know, who's serious, who's not. We asked people to work together on that. We got some, so we got some legitimate pushback around over-testing. And let me be clear, I do think there's such a thing as over-testing. When I ran to Chicago Public Schools, our kids were taking the Illinois state tests. Our kids were also taking the Iowa test. I didn't understand why they were taking the Iowa test. I <laughs> cut out that. I let me about 50% of the test. But they had taken both for, for decades. Um, having said that, again, my personal opinion, I do think we need to assess kids every single year. I think we need to know whether kids are on track or not. So there's an over-testing extreme, and there's a, well, we should do no testing. And I, I'm sort of in the middle of that road that we need to assess and have honest conversations with kids, with parents, who's doing what. That I think we could have done. Where we got in the most trouble was then we wanted to link student learning to teacher evaluation. That was almost a bridge too far. Um, to answer your question, what we should have done in hindsight is had massive town halls like this with parents all over the country. That's hard to do with the federal government. You're so far removed. I should have done a set of them myself. I did a couple. We should have done more. What we needed to do is get more teachers and principals bought in so they could do it because it's just the, the, the volume, the scale is hard there. But that was a massive miss. That's one. Secondly, the legitimate debate is should we have not moved on teachers? If we had just done standards and just done assessments, we would have got less pushback. And it would have been mostly from the right, not from the left. As David said, the pushback from the left came to tying teacher eval to student learning. And we had lots of internal fierce debates on this, and to this day, there are members of our team that think we probably shouldn't have taken that step. I would just say personally, I'm glad we did. And for all the pushback, for all the drama and noise, in many states now, student learning is a piece of teacher evaluation. And in a perfect world, I get it, you would maybe do this over five or 10 or 15 years. I always argue that our kids have one chance to get an education, and that my self-critique, and not everyone agrees, my critique, the, the public critique of me, both in Chicago and D.C., was often he was too fast, too fast, too fast, too quick. My honest self-critique is that I was too slow. And that's a hard thing to say, but there are times when I wish I would have pushed harder, not less. There are times when for politics you try and compromise or do whatever, and that I think rarely are kids well served there. So in a world devoid of kids, an academic setting, you would have done standards first and done assessments four or five years later and done teacher eval five or ten years later. We don't have that luxury. We don't mm. have that luxury. Mm. And I would rather people grapple with really hard issues than make, a than make it against the law to talk about those issues. Mm. That's what I was rebelling against. Mm. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Stephanie and I'm a freshman here at Harvard College. My question has to do with resources and funding. So my mother is a Title I, um, is a teacher at a Title I elementary school um, in California, and I had the opportunity to volunteer for three years at her school. And one thing I noticed was that the school itself was heavily um, under-resourced, and there was just, the children had no books, they had no school supplies, teachers were having to pay out of pocket to just make their classroom enjoyable. And oftentimes you'd see one teacher to 30 students, and those 30 students, Half of them were reading two to three years below grade level and performing very low in math and reading. And that was just something that's very difficult for a teacher to deal with because mm -hmm. they have no help in the classroom. So I was just wondering what you think should be done to make sure that these teachers have the resources and funding that they need to make the classroom enjoyable and to make sure that um, their students can excel. Well, first, thank your mom for her service and thank you for helping out. So. This gets at the, I mean, these are all great questions, but this sort of gets at the heart of what is American public education. 
And for me, the, the joy, the hope of public education, why I've devoted a huge part of my life to it, is, is the possibility that a great public education is the equalizer. That it doesn't matter your race, your class, your zip code, your socioeconomic status, if you work hard, if you play by the rules, that the world's your oyster, and that is sometimes true. The counter is that, as we know, let's talk K-12 now. I'll put early childhood to the side, put higher ed to the side for, for a moment. K-12, to how is that largely funded? So federal money is 8 to 10%. State is usually 40 to 50. And the other 40 to 50 is local, local property taxpayers. So places that have wealthier homes get a lot more money than places that have less wealthy homes. So when I ran the Chicago public schools, 85% of my students lived below the poverty line. And families that lived five miles, six miles north of us in Winnetka and Wilmette, they had twice as much money spent on their education every single year than my kids. And you think about the compounding impact of that 13 years, 14 years, it's devastating. So I sued the state of Illinois when I ran the Chicago Public Schools. I lost that suit. But what is heartbreaking is that we all care about our own children we don't care about our neighbor's children and other people's children. We all take care of our own. Those of us with means find a way to take care of our own. Um, until we decide that every kid deserves access to after-school programs, to music, to AP classes, to college tours, to textbooks. Um, right now, we surveyed with a you know, civil rights uh, data collection. There are many, many, many schools and minority communities that don't have access to AP classes today, 2018, don't have access to it. Talent is a hell of a lot more evenly distributed in our country than opportunity. And until we decide to equalize opportunity, again, you can't equalize outcomes, but we could equalize out. But what we have is a public education system far too often where the gap between the haves and the have-nots gets exacerbated, grows, and that's devastating. Hmm. We're going to go for about another five to ten minutes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Benjamin Bolger, and I'm a Harvard alumnus, and this is my daughter, Benjamina, who's four. <laughs> and uh, my question is about homeschooling. Uh, for part of my life, I grew up in rural Michigan with a single mother who was physically disabled, and she homeschooled me. And uh, sometimes we didn't have running water or electricity, but she found a way to take me to Gettysburg when we were studying the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Uh, or to Michigan State University or University of Michigan to attend lectures when I was very young. So uh, we're now trying to figure out what we're going to do with our, our own daughter now, who's four, and I'm wondering what are your thoughts on modern homeschooling? What are the pros and cons? I know there's a lot of opinions on it. I think I'm a little bit, again, I'm just very pragmatic and agnostic. Um, sounds like your mother did an amazing job with almost nothing. You turned out okay. It turned uh, out all right. <laughs> your daughter's probably the smartest person in this room. I appreciate her coming out uh, tonight. Um, where you have parents who have those capabilities, I think that's a great option. Um, where you have parents who don't have those capabilities is a less great option. For me, I do think parents should have choice. So whether it's you know, a public school or you know, a public charter school or to homeschool, I'll support that. For me, honestly, the vast 90% of Americans always have and always will go to public schools. And so for me, my goal is to try and create a, at least a great, ideally two or three great public school options. But where parents want to have that option, they should have that option, they should have resources to do it. Sometimes it's life changing, um, sometimes it's pretty destructive. Thanks yes, very much. Appreciate yes, sir. I'm Pablo, and I am a junior here at the college. And I'm from one of the many states that earlier this year participated in large teacher strikes. Which, which state? Oklahoma. Yep. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the future of teacher strikes and of movements by teachers to improve both teacher salaries and funding for schools? Yeah, I asked, Oklahoma's an interesting story. Um, Oklahoma is one of, the, one of the few states that actually walked away from higher standards uh, based upon politics. And a recent study came out from a right, from a conservative uh, Fordham Institute that talked about Oklahoma's standards, and it was pretty devastating. So it's politically expedient for Governor Fallon to do that. Um, didn't make sense. But the performance levels went down. Performance levels went down, and a huge, huge percent of their community college students are taking remedial classes. Um, all those, it, it won't be true going forward, all of those strikes, 
again, just the facts, were in Republican-led states. And so you had governors who chose politically to starve public education. And uh, I'll give you, again, too many stories, but North Carolina was a state with a rich history of supporting public education. Governor Hunt was a good, good friend, someone I admire tremendously. Um, I met with a teacher from North Carolina who was selling plasma, selling blood to make ends meet. Mm. And for me to ask a teacher to do that means we're not serious on the profession. So I appreciated the activism. <laughs> I, we needed it. Um, I will always challenge us on the left. Um, I'll be the biggest advocate for more resources at every level. Early childhood, K to 12, I will always ask for more resources. But I want to challenge on the, us on the left, as we talked about, to ask for accountability or to hold ourselves accountable so it can't be a free lunch. So we have to pay teachers more. We have to have more books in classrooms. We have to have more technology. Um, we have to challenge the right on that issue. But we have to challenge ourselves on the left to say, if we do that, we're going to see high school graduation rates go to X to Y. Um, Early childhood, I'd go do the big early childhood count, thousands of kids. I'd talk about my mother's program, talk about I was the biggest cheerleader, rah, 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 rah. And then I'd say, then we've got to make sure that our kids are ready to go to kindergarten. Dead silence. Dead silence. It would always get really awkward. Um, we, gotta ha we have to have both those conversations. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a current PhD student at the education school. You mentioned that one of the leading reasons that change isn't happening in education is perhaps a lack of courage, specifically political courage. I wonder, though, if the action gap is more rooted in disagreement about what metrics we should be using for education policy decisions. The current Secretary of Education relies on both different sources of information and different metrics, as well as different understandings of the purpose of education in general compared to perhaps public statements you made. Specifically, I'd point to decisions uh, regarding what constitutes effectiveness in higher education accreditation, among a host of others. Do you think we need to seek agreement on what information is trustworthy for political decision making before courage can be marshaled for political change? What's the best step forward? That's a good question. Uh, I think, and they would be a, give you probably a more articulate answer than, than I could. I think in a Maybe in a perfect world you'd be right. I think it's impossible to get consensus around what is fact today. And in fact, there's been a very concerted effort to reduce trust in objective facts, to reduce trucks, trust in every institution, higher education, the media, whatever it might be. So for me, I don't know how to get to where you're going. What I want to try and do is, again, is train young people to think critically and to think independently and to navigate this very, very complex world of information overload and good information, bad information. We have to equip young people with the skills to do that. Um, I would argue, and again, maybe people, I would just put, again, those couple goals out there, leading the world in access to pre-K, trying to get high school graduation rates to 90%, trying to lead the world in college completion. And when I say college completion, I, four-year universities, two-year community colleges, trade, technical, vocational training, I put all that together. And then I would like to see the debate around the strategies to achieve that. Um, my opinion, again, with the current administration, is not only do we have no goals, we have no real strategies behind it. And so I would argue it's not, I wouldn't say a lack of political courage. I don't even think it's, it's not even that sophisticated. It doesn't take courage to vote on education. We just don't value it. So for me, that's the bridge that I would like us to get across. And if we just voted based upon whatever our beliefs were, things would change overnight. Um, it's the fact that no one, there's no accountability. There's no accountability. That's why things sort of limp along. And that for me is the hurdle that all of us as voters have to cross. This has to be, doesn't have to be the only issue. I would love it to be. This gun violence would be my two issues. Um, but is a basket of three or four or five things and people go to the voting booth in November, what is this person going to do to increase educational opportunity, however you define that? Um, I would take that as a huge win, a huge win. You know, a time of great tumult in this country and tremors of fear, I cannot think of a better way to begin the forum season uh, than with a serious conversation about hard issues, hard truths, and not holding back. Thank you, Arnie. I, I want to ask Coach Amaker, if you would please, to step forward for one last moment. If you'll hold here. Huh. 
Oh, oh, oh God. <laughs> you're, you're breaking me down here, boy. <laughs> thank you. On behalf of Harvard Basketball, our team, and our program, we'd just like to say thank you for oh, thank you so much. your time. We always say your time, your talent, and your treasure mm-hmm. for what you bring to Harvard. And David, yeah. thank you so much for the Thank you, Tommy. Thank, thank you, and thank you, thank you to your team. We're looking forward to a great. Yeah, yeah. God, you're, you're nice. team, come on up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks very much. Good to see you guys. Terrific. Good to see you guys. Hi there. Hi there. Good. 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 Good